Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to another week of our Lenten study on Le Miserable. I'm Father Schneier. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wait a minute or two for all of our platforms to uh, get in sync, whether it's Facebook, Live, or YouTube. Uh, we're just going to wait a minute or so to let everything kind of get online and allow folks to be able to log in and view the and view the video, but uh, a happy Wednesday morning to you. Uh, our kids have a late start today, so uh, they're, they're all lining up. The cars are lining up at least out in the parking lot, so um, might, might hear some kids yelling out there. Uh, but we had a late start today for the school. It's a beautiful day. It'll be a little windy, um, but, uh, but yeah, it should be a very, very nice day. I was able to go golfing yesterday with a, with a friend, so uh, first round of the year, it was a little rusty. It's kind of spring training for all of us, but... Um, the weather's finally starting to warm up, which is good. It's very good. So um, and we'll wait another minute or so here, a couple minutes to get everyone uh, logged in and get the video live. See if I can get on here. There we go. All right. And we'll be talking about the character of Fantine today. Uh, she's obviously one of the most well-known characters in all of Les Mis. Uh, an entire volume, really, of the Victor Hugo novel is at least named after her. Um, and obviously she sings one of the most well-known songs from the musical, I Dreamed a Dream. My, my voice is not that high, so I won't be singing it, or if I do, it'll be much lower and probably won't sound nearly as good as Anne Hathaway. But uh, I right, got a few people getting in here again. We'll wait another minute or so till everyone can log on and be able to, to watch together and hit refresh on your, on your Facebook and YouTube feed, and <clears throat> we'll go ahead and get started. I also love how you're getting to see our offices. Mine's pretty plain. I'm working on working on getting some maybe the walls repainted. There's a lot of a lot of screws and holes in the and the in the walls in my office, and uh, <laughs> looking to maybe just kind of start with a clean slate. So because I got some stuff I want to hang up on the walls, so we're we're hoping to to do that here soon. Uh, and obviously Father Schrader's office with his weird cow mask or whatever that's up on top of his desk. Uh, I do not have that, <laughs> but. Uh, it's nice you guys are able to get a look into our offices here at Incarnate Word. <clears throat> and we'll give it another minute or so, give or take. And again, folks, uh, if if any of you have any questions whatsoever, don't hesitate to send in a comment throughout the uh, throughout the study. Uh, you know, I'll get to them at, at kind of the end. Uh, we'll take all the questions then. But if you ever have a question at any time during during any of these sessions, feel free to to let us know. Um, we always love to hear from you and just what you have to say, or even just stuff to, it's an insight that you have into, into this wonderful story. So, uh, so absolutely make sure you, you know, hit us up with a comment and, uh, we can, uh, bring your question to everyone here virtually. So, um, always looking to, you know, provide more interaction or as much interaction as we can. Uh, even if it's, even this, you know, even if this is all done virtually. So, All right, so let's go ahead and begin. Uh, it's Wednesday, so we'll be talking about Les Miserables and the character of Fantine. Why don't we go ahead, and, or Fantine rather, why don't we go ahead and begin with a prayer? We'll, we'll begin with a memorari. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy, hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, a happy Wednesday morning to all of you, for and welcome to the continuation of week three 
of our study on Les Miserables. I'm Father Schneier, obviously, and we're going to be talking about the character of Fantine today. Uh, week one, if you'll recall, we talked about Jean Valjean. Week two, the character of Javert, uh, the police inspector. And today we kind of shift to the character of Fantine. Fantine is really uh, the first of the miserables, you could say, that we encounter in the story of Les Miserables. Uh, Valjean and Javert have maybe a typical hero-villain type of relationship, you could say, but Fantine and the other citizenry, um, I guess, are, are sort of dealt with a little bit differently. It's an analysis, the story is an analysis of their state in life. It's an analysis of how they got to be where they are and other people's interactions with them. So uh, to recap a little bit about the character of Fantine, in the musical at least, I'll do the musical version here. She's a young woman who we find working in Monsieur Madeleine, or Jean Valjean, working in his factory. Um, she, she's working there trying to make ends meet. She's a single mother. Um, and she's having to keep the identity of her daughter, Cosette, private. Uh, Jean Valjean, as Monsieur Madeleine, uh, provided work to many, many people in the town of Montreuil. But his one stipulation to his workers was that they needed to be honest with him. They needed to be transparent with him about everything, about who they are. And that was all he wanted from his workers. And Fantine is scared about just her, her state of being a single mother. She thinks that she'll be looked down upon, maybe, whatever that might be. Uh, she, she, doesn't, she, she doesn't tell. She doesn't tell Monsieur Madeleine um, about, about who she is and about the fact that she does have a daughter. She keeps that a secret, and she's sending money back to an innkeeper man and his wife, uh, as the musical describes, and of course that's the Thenardiers, who are uh, just very unscrupulous people. Uh, her daughter is being cared for by them, working for the Thenardiers in their inn, and Cosette is also sending money to help, uh, in theory at least, to help take care of her. And... The Tenardiers are basically extorting her for money. They keep saying, oh, your daughter is sick. Cosette is sick. She needs more money. You know, we need more money to be able to take care of her. Uh, and they keep asking for more and more and more. And Fantine just keeps kind of spiraling more and more into debt, trying to help uh, care for her daughter, which, is, which, is, which comes from a good place, at the very least, um, wanting, to, wanting to make sure that her daughter Cosette is taken care of and is loved and at least has a stable place to grow up, even if it's not with her. Well, anyway, uh, Fantine's secret is found out by other workers in the, in the factory, and, and she's fired. Jean Valjean fires her for not being honest and transparent with him. He fires her. It was, and now Fantine is really, really down on her luck. Uh, her only way of making money is gone. Uh, she doesn't have any way to, to provide, not just for Cosette, but for herself as well. She's very poor. And as a result of that, she resorts to some very desperate means in order to obtain the money that she needs. She first sells her hair. She cuts her hair um, to be used for wigs, for dolls, or things like that. Um, she, she sells her hair, her beautiful hair. And Further after that, she sells her teeth. She sells two of her teeth um, used for I guess, prosthetics or, or dental pieces. She sells her teeth. And then later on, she sells her, her body uh, as a prostitute. Uh, she resorts even to prostitution in order to, um, in order to get the money that she needs to take care of herself and her daughter. And eventually... Uh, she's caught in the act of prostitution. She kind of strikes back against a man who's really violating her uh, in, in so many ways. And the man calls out for Javert. And Javert comes and, and Monsignor, uh, Monsieur Madeleine comes out as well. Again, he's the mayor of the town. And Jean Valjean recognizes Fantine as one of his former workers. And... Javert wants to throw her into prison. You know, she's just a nobody. She's a, she's a dirty prostitute, as, as, as Javert would say. Um, 
But Valjean has mercy on her. Uh, Fantine re re relates or retells um, Jean Valjean all about what he did to her and how him firing her has led her to that state. How the fact that she lost her job at his factory is, you know, is the reason why she had to resort to selling her hair, to selling her teeth, and to even engaging in prostitution. And she's very sick at this time as well. She's uh, just not, a, not well taken care of uh, at, at all, by any stretch of the imagination. And Valjean decides, you know what, I, I need to atone for my imperfection, for my, for my misdeeds of firing you. I probably shouldn't have done that. That's probably what he was thinking. And so he, he decides, I'm going to care for you. I'm going to bring you to a hospital and have the nuns take care of you. So he brings her to a hospital and essentially arrange, and pays for it all, pays for it all himself. Uh, out of the generosity of his heart. And he wanted to bring Cosette to be with her um, at her death because he knew that she was going to die, that Fantine was going to die. But he's unable to do so. And so he resolves, I'm going to take Cosette as my own, to adopt her and to give her a good life, uh, to love her and to care for her um, rather than you know, live the life that, that Fantine eventually lived. Because someone in Cosette's situation could very easily have fallen into that. And so... Valjean takes you know, Cosette as, um, as his daughter, as his own. And, and it, it's beautiful that, that Valjean eventually sort of sees that, yeah, I was wrong to fire Fantine. And now I'm going to at least try to make amends by caring for her daughter. So that's, that's at least what the musical tells us about Fantine. But there's a lot more to her story, actually, that the musical does not recount. But thankfully, the BBC version of Les Mis goes into detail about Fantine and how she got to be in that state of working in the factory for uh, Monsieur Madeleine. So um, it, 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 it's a few years before, obviously, but Fantine is really a middle-class French girl. She's not poor, she's not destitute, but she's also not insanely wealthy. Um, right, right in the middle. Um, a, a relatively content life, most things are you know, work hard for him, sure, but a lot of things at her disposal to be able to do. Um, and yeah, she's not poor or destitute by any means. Uh, typical French middle class, you could say. Um, but but also not also not wealthy either. Um, and she's very beautiful, obviously. She's very idealistic and innocent. But you could also maybe say she's a little bit naive as as a young girl at that time. And. On one summer evening, she's out with friends, and she, a wealthy aristocrat named Felix essentially sweeps her off her feet. And he, his two friends who are, who are with him sweep her friends off their feet as well. Uh, and, they all, and they all fall in love with uh, these couples. Uh, Fantine and Felix, and, and then the two, his two friends and, and her two friends. They all, they all sort of fall in love. And um, in the BBC version, one of her friends warns Fantine that... Really, we're just their bit of fun. And she says, you know, they're, these guys are just with us for the summer, but eventually they're probably going to abandon us because their, their families want them to marry richer girls. Um, and this, this friend is clearly older and maybe much, and much less innocent uh, in, her, in her relationship with the world, you could say. Um, much less naive. She, she's very, she, she's realistic. She knows that, this is probably going to be very fleeting, this, this romance that they've all been swept up into. And she warns Fontaine. She says that these guys are probably going to abandon us. That we're, we're just their bit of fun and they're going to they're gonna, you know, leave us at the end of this summer. Um, but Fontaine doesn't really listen to that advice as much. Uh, and she spends the summer with Felix. Um, and they talk about how in love they are. And she mentions how much she wants to spend the rest of her life with him. And Felix sort of agrees with it. But you can tell, especially in the BBC version, that his heart is, isn't fully in it. Um, he, he's, he's a man who doesn't want to enter into commitment. And you can tell that Fantine is much more um, swept up by the romance of it than Felix is. Um, and you can sort of guess where, where it happens next, or what happens next, I should say. Uh, at the end of the summer, the three men 
invite the three women to a, a fancy dinner uh, and tell them that during the course of that dinner, they'll have a, a big surprise for them. And it's this, this amazing, sumptuous dinner at this beautiful home. And the men are getting drunk and they, they eventually leave the room again, telling the, the women that they have a surprise waiting for them. And the surprise is the waiter coming in with a letter. And the letter essentially says, when you read that, you know, by the time you read this, the three of us will be gone on horseback going back to our families. Um, these, these men are abandoning these, these three women, again, under the guise of a surprise. Um, but they assure the women that the meal has been paid for, um, which for an audience is, is, is insulting. It's insulting that they feel that, the, that all these women are worth is the cost of a meal. Uh, it, it's immensely insulting. And you can see the women, at least the, the actresses and how well they play their roles, their hearts are just broken, Fantine in particular. Because during the summer, the summer she had become pregnant uh, with a daughter. She and Felix had, had, uh, had gotten pregnant and they were expecting. And in addition to having this man that she thought that she loved abandon her, she's now on her own uh, as, an unwed, as an unwed mother uh, with a child. And Fantine knows that she might have been a little bit naive. And, certain, and maybe too innocent and too trusting of Felix. And certainly, you know, Felix and his friends are absolutely reprehensible uh, for what they did and abandoning these, these women in the way that they did, and especially in Felix's attitude towards Fantine in particular, um, leaving her to take care of the daughter. Um, and I believe the, the wording in the BBC is that they were replaced rapidly. Um, and in the musical, uh, Fantine sort of alludes to this in, um, in the song, I Dreamed a Dream. She says, you know, he slept a summer by my side. He filled my days with endless wonder. He took my childhood in his stride, and he, but he was gone when autumn came. You know, alluding to that summer bliss that she experienced um, that, that swept her off her feet and yet unfortunately um, was too good to be true. Uh, she she was the one who uh, who loved Felix and wanted to spend the rest of her life with him, but obviously Felix did not. And so you can see that it's, it's a combination of Fantine's innocence um, and, and and also sin. Not not you know you could yeah I guess technically Fantine, but also Felix's sin as well, uh, the sin of others mainly. Um, that combination of innocence and sin that has left Fantine in this position. And, and, and it's a tragedy. Um, it's a tragedy for this woman uh, who, you know, it, her, her main vice, if you will, was just her, her being trusting of this man, of, of Felix, and being swept off her feet and, 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 and her innocence. And, and if you look at what happens here with Fantine and just her person itself, um, she feels dispensable. She, she feels replaceable in this moment, and she feels repeatable. I mean, she's been cast aside as someone who can be easily thrown away at the end of a summer, even though she has a daughter as well. Um, she's been completely dispensed of by Felix. Uh, she feels very replaceable, knowing that Felix is probably going to fall in love with some other woman. Um, that the same things that uh, Felix had said to her and that she had said to him would probably just be, you know, would be repeated again, and she feels repeatable, knowing that Felix would probably do the same thing again to another naive girl. Um, the problem is this, no one is meant to live like this, to feel that they are dispensable, to feel that they are replaceable, to feel that they are repeatable. Um, and yet that is how Fantine and her friends were treated. Um, literally, she and her friends' is worth to those three men was the price of a meal. Um, that, that to them is what, at least presented as that that is what they were shown to be worth uh by by these men um and again that's a tragedy they were sh they were chewed up and spit out by the by these very pathetic guys with no consideration um for their humanity for them they were no better than garbage um in the, in the eyes of these of these reprehensible men um and and yeah it's a tragedy that fontaine feels that way that she's 
feels dispensable, replaceable, and repeatable. But I think if you were to look at our own society, brothers and sisters, we treat people like this all the time. Uh, this is how society treats people. Uh, not just, you know, looking at, you know, whether it's the poor, but also even in love. Um, you know, just, just the idea of, you know, dating apps, swipe left, swipe right. Um, there is no, there's no regard for the humanity of people. They're seen as dispensable, replaceable, and repeatable. Um, and we're blessed, at least in our Catholic faith, to have what we refer to as the theology of the body. Uh, it's a combination of teachings by Pope St. John Paul II on our sexuality and on our dignity and, and just even our anthropology of who we are as human beings, how we're created, how we're meant to love, how we're meant to enter into relationship. Um, and it presents the authentic love of Jesus Christ uh, compared to what our world might, might try to present as the real thing, as something authentic. And, and unfortunately, in Les Mis, Fantine experiences the counterfeit. You could say um, she experiences uh, something that pretends to be real love, but really only uses the other person and sees people as dispensable, replaceable and repeatable. Um, and really, I think this gets to a deeper truth, brothers and sisters. The opposite of love is not to hate someone. It's to use them. It's to use the other person for your own selfish ends. That's the opposite of love. Um, Unfortunately, using other people can be very slyly done under the guise of love or under the auspices of love or under the appearance of love, as Fantine experienced in the early days of her romance with Felix. But unfortunately, she, she realized she was being used uh, by Felix. Again, as, as the summer fling, she was being used for his own pleasure, only to be cast aside and seen as, you know, dispensable and repeatable later on. And again, no human being is meant to live like this, brothers and sisters. Um, none of us are. We're called to see people as indispensable, as irreplaceable, and as unrepeatable. Um, that's how Christ loves us, and that's how we are called to love one another. And the beauty, especially of whether it's just the sacrament of marriage or our church's teachings on sexuality, it sees the human being and sees the human person in that light. It begins from there. That God sees us as unique, as someone indispensable, that, that God would never want to cast out. Real love sees another person in that light. Christ, of course, saw us in that same way on the cross. And yet again, unfortunately, we... We often treat people as dispensable, replaceable, or repeatable all the time. And, and, that, and that's not real love. That's not real love. And unfortunately, Fantine thought it, thought it was. Again, it had some appearances of real love, but it really wasn't. It wasn't the real thing. Um, now, again, a little bit just more about Felix and, and Fantine. Uh, Felix's wealth is what allows him, or at least gives him the license in his eyes to abandon Fantine and, and abandon his responsibilities to Fantine and Cosette. And Fantine is also a victim of a society that ignores the poor. You know, um, we, we live in an immensely prosperous society, and a wealthy society, probably the most prosperous in all of human history. And at the time, Fran France was doing pretty well, um, uh, had a lot of success in various economic, by economic standards. Um, and it had a whole host of, of good things happening, but it was also a society that was prone to ignoring the poor, um, just as we are today. And unfortunately, situations like Fontaine's play out in every society, in every age, and in every country, uh, literally everywhere. Uh, the poor are too easily exploited um, all around our world. Um, we can often look at other people and see them as really the tools of our own decadence or the pursuit of our own pleasure. Uh, we can see other people as means to an end, which is using them, which again is the, is the opposite of love. Um, and certainly seeing it as an us versus them, like us who are fine and, and, though, and those poor people over there. That's, that's how sometimes it can, it can play out in our heads. And so that's sometimes what we can think. And I, I think Fontaine more than anything else, epitomizes more than anything else the throwaway culture 
that Pope Francis talks about so much. And that throwaway culture can take place in so many ways. It has so many um, examples and so many facets of our society. Um, but Fantine is sort of what happens when a throwaway culture um, takes its toll on a human being. Um, he's an example of what happens to a human being in a throwaway culture. And Felix is someone who literally throws her away. Um, and we see the tragic effects of what that does to the human person, how a throwaway culture exploits um, and, and, and hurts the human being. And so, you know, further down that rabbit hole of mistreatment that Fantine eventually falls into and being forced to sell her hair, her teeth, and then her body. All of these are done, at least coming from a noble place of wanting to provide for her daughter. But at the same time, all of these instances or ways in which Fantine is being further used by others. Um, you know, her hair is being used for other things. Her teeth are being used and her body is, of course, being used um, being treated with the same reverence as a vending machine by so many by so many of these men, um, and and again she, she's she's been burned by a cheap imitation of love with Felix and in that and when we've been burned like that unfortunately we try looking for the real thing all the more we keep looking for fulfillment um, looking for someone to finally treat us with dignity and to see us as indispensable irreplaceable and unrepeatable. But the problem is if all we've ever known is the counterfeit version of that, we don't really know the difference between that and the real thing. And it's harder and harder for us to, to, to know the difference. We can keep falling down kind of snowball style um, into that path. And that's what unfortunately happens with Fontaine. I think kind of going back to that idea of the throwaway culture, though, uh, and really our own responsibility, especially during this Lenten season, I think it, it, it speaks to the idea of almsgiving. <clears throat> you know, we, we can talk about prayer, we can talk about fasting, we can talk about almsgiving. Um, those are really the three pillars of Lent. Uh, and prayer and fasting are kind of the easiest to, um, for us to tangibly grasp because we have to do them throughout Lent, especially on Fridays and giving up things. Um, but almsgiving is equally important. Um, Prayer and fasting are, are relatively dry and, and stale almost without, without the lifeblood of almsgiving. Uh, St. Peter Chrysologus uh, talked at length about the importance of almsgiving in our lives. And I think so much of the throwaway culture that we have, whether it's throwing away other people and treating them poorly in, 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 in love and our sexuality or, or even exploiting the poor, so much of that throwaway culture that we have exists because we have made it so unfortunately. Um, it exists because we sometimes aren't willing to take that courageous and bold step of hospitality, of seeing the humanity in other people, um, when instead we just see them as dispensable and repeatable. You can look at two examples in Les Mis, where people take that courageous and bold step. The first of which is the bishop who takes in Jean Valjean, who sees him as more than a criminal. In this world that saw Valjean as, as just a madman and, and an angry person, that bishop takes a courageous and bold step and says, I'm going to treat you like a brother. I'm going to treat you like a human being. And I want to take you into my home. And the other bold step you could say would be Jean Valjean taking in Cosette. This man who, had, who really hadn't known how to love. Takes in this, this, this little girl who he comes to love as his own. Um, those two moments of really bold action, of hospitality, of, of seeing through what the world might present people as, and seeing the humanity and seeing the dignity in them, who aren't willing to throw away people, to just cast them off to the side like everybody else. The bishop and Valjean are the two examples of that. But unfortunately, too many people experience the cruelty <clears throat> and the cold-hearted nature of others, um, like Fantine. You know, her, her experience of the world was one of cruelty. It was one of people being cold to her and not seeing her for who she was, for not beholding her dignity as a human being. Um, and whether, it, whether it's directly by cruelty or even by in, indifference, which I think is probably more common, you know, the, the result is the same. Um, the poor and the marginalized are ignored or sometimes even not, not even looked at, not even made eye contact with and are thrown away as dispensable and, 
and disposable and just repeatable. Um, that's what it means to be in a throwaway culture. Yeah, this, this happens in all kinds of places. It happens with the unborn. It happens with the poor. It happens with all kinds of people or with immigrants. You know, it happens in so many ways um, that, that people are just seen as throwaway or disposable. Um, and often our response, I think, is one of, well, you know, I, you know, I'll sympathize with it, but they have to sort out their own problems. That's sometimes what our response is. Um, but, but I think that falls so short. It falls so short. Because so many people, unfortunately, did that with Fontaine. You know, just, just a normal bystander looking at this sickly woman who, who hardly has any hair and has her teeth out and probably clearly is a prostitute. They, they say, oh, you know, I sympathize with you. She's probably down on her luck. But she's got to sort out her own problems. You know, how, how many people do you think, just ordinary people that weren't even recounted in a Les Miserables story, would, would have looked at someone like that and had that same reaction? You know, I, I sympathize with you. I know you're down on your luck. I might throw you a few cents. But really, you got to figure out your own problems. That falls so short of the gospel. It falls so short of the gospel. That, that, that's the priest and the Levi with the good Samaritan, with, 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 that, with the man you know, who, who, had, who, was, who had been robbed. And, but finally, the good Samaritan says, no, I'm going to do something bold. I'm going to lift you up. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to put you on the back of my donkey and take you to town, and I'm going to pay for your care. You know, the, the priest and the Levi just says, oh, solve your own problems. And you got robbed. Tough luck. And, you know, I sympathize with you. But in the end, you got to solve your own problems. That's, that falls so short of what the gospel demands of us, brothers and sisters. The gospel demands so much more. We are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keeper. You know, if we, we, and we, we, have to, we have to see it, our world in that light. We are our brother's keeper. You know, too often I think we, we kind of excuse poverty or injustice or whatever you call it and say, well, I, you know, I guess it's God's will. You know, God wouldn't give us anything that we can't overcome. And yeah, it's a cross, but, you know, we got to solve our own problems and, 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 and rise above it. And I think, unfortunately, that mindset ignores the sin that led to that point. Um, yeah, it might, it might be even a little bit of sin of the person involved. But at the same time, it's also the sins of others. And we have to see other people as worthy of our attention and worthy of our effort. Because if there is someone in this world whose life is threatened and, or whose dignity is disrespected, that person should have a claim on our hearts. And we shouldn't just cast them aside as, you know, not my problem. No, it is our problem. It is our problem. If someone's life is threatened or their dignity is disrespected, it is our problem. It is our problem. We need to see it as such. That will help us to take the bold action like Jean Valjean did in taking care of Fantine or the bishop did in taking care of Jean Valjean. They saw someone who was going through difficulty and said, that is my problem to fix, to help, or to at least offer my heart to. That, that is how we must see the world, brothers and sisters. Not saying, oh, it, that, that's not my problem. No, it is. We are our brother's keeper. And Fantine is a tragic example of someone who was kind of kicked, up, you know, kicked the can down the road. So many people who just said, oh, she's not my problem. Until Valjean finally said, no, she is. But yeah, because I, I fired her as, you know, that, that's one of the reasons. But as a human being, no. This is, this is something I need to do. I am my brother's keeper. And so that's why he helps her. Um, and so we have to have a heart that sees other people and says, that is my problem and I want to help. Whether it's with women, you know, dealing with, with an unplanned pregnancy um, or, or people going through addictions. That's another area where I think a lot of, there's a lot of people going through difficulty trying to get back on their feet. Um, we can sympathize rightly with the people in their situation. But beyond that, you know, we, we don't do too much. And I think that does very little to end the throwaway culture in which we find ourselves. We have to do more than just merely sympathize with others and say, yeah, my, my heart is with you, or to empathize with them. We have to do more than that. Our hearts need to be moved to be our brother's keeper, to be our sister's keeper. Um, I know Father Schrader mentioned this. He said, you know, it's a tragedy that for especially many 
unwed mothers, you know, unwed pregnant mothers who, that it's a tragedy that they see abortion as something that, that's necessary for them because there's no way out. Um, and I think so much of that is because, yeah, our society doesn't present alternatives to abortion and other things like that. But I think it's also up to us to make sure that, yeah, we are our brother's keeper and our sister's keeper. To see that as, as a problem for us to say, yeah, we need to help. And I know there are so many wonderful and courageous people who do works of mercy, whether it's for the poor, uh, for, for young mothers, or for whoever that might be. And th those are, that's where we need to give our alms. Uh, almsgiving sees others as worthy of our help, worthy of the work of our hearts. Uh, and to see, yeah, see problems in the world as my problem for me to help solve and for me to give of my heart to. Um, at the end of Fontaine's life, and, and this isn't recounted in the BBC, in, in, in the musical, this isn't recounted in the musical version, it's done in the BBC. Um, a priest says that Fontaine isn't worth being buried. She's not worth burying, which I think is probably the ultimate disrespect that she has shown in the, in the, the entire story of Les Miserables. Um, again, I think that just a throwaway culture, you, you've got it right there. That someone is not even worth burying in the, in the eyes of this priest. Um, Valjean obviously sees her, sees her differently. And, and obviously the bishop from the beginning of the story would have, would have absolutely seen her in the exact same way. We are called to not just look at other people as dispensable, replaceable, and repeatable. But to see them as beloved children of God, to see them as our brothers and sisters, and to say, your problems are my problems. I am my brother's keeper. I am my sister's keeper. Um, thankfully, Valjean looks at Fantine in this way and says, no, this is my problem and I need to help you. Um, Fantine is the embodiment, really, uh, of, again, as I said, of so much. She's the consequences of someone being used. She's the it's a chain reaction of misusing our gift of sexuality because it's often women and children that suffer the most whenever that happens. Um, and she's really what happens when we ignore wrong, when we see it as someone else's problem. Uh, one other thing maybe to talk about with Fantine is sort of how she's viewed by society as a whole in relation to, um, in relation to her sins. Uh, especially in the moment where she's caught in prostitution and Valjean and Javert come together and they have these different reactions of how to deal with this woman, Javert wanting to throw her into prison and Valjean wanting to care for her, seeing that she is sick. It's a lot, it's a lot like that woman caught in adultery in the Gospels where the Pharisees want to stone her, um, where they present to Jesus, this woman's been caught in the act, caught in the act of adultery and Moses commanded us to stone her. What do you want us to do? And Jesus begins writing on the ground and says, let the one who is without sin throw the first stone. And, um, and the Pharisees one by one walk away and Jesus goes to the woman and says, is no one here to condemn you? She says, no. And he says, neither do I, but go and sin no more. Um, I think it's a, it's a beautiful mirror image of that scene from the musical of uh, when Fantine is you know, caught in the act of you know, fighting back against this man violating her and Valjean and and Javert are both there. Um, and I think that Fantine is seen by Javert as the sum of all of her failures, as the sum of all of her sins. And again, Javert is a man of justice uh, and one who wants to uphold the law. He sees people in their failures and said, this is where we need punishment. This is where we need correction. He sees Fantine as the, the, the lump sum of her failures and of her shortcomings. That's how he views her. And again, I think it's emblematic of other people of how they view her as well. But Javert in particular, he sees her as the sum of her failures. Um, that is a horrible way to see someone. That's a horrible way to see someone. Because we are all sinners, as Javert will learn later on. He'll see his own imperfections and somehow can't confront them. He sees himself, unfortunately, as the sum of his of all of his failures. But looking at someone and seeing the, the lump sum of their failures and, and sins is a horrible way to look at someone. Because we are so much more than that. No person, 
No person whatsoever is beyond mercy. No person is beyond compassion. No person is above redemption. Every single one of us is capable of that. Every one of us is capable of turning our lives around for God to live an upright and holy life. Not just with our own elbow grace, but with the help of other people surrounded by a community of people willing to lift us up. And unfortunately, Javert just looks at Fantine and sees her as the sum of her sins, which, which, which is a tragedy. Because again, we're all sinners. And we know that if people really wanted to, they could look at us and see the sum of our sins. And if we were to sum up all of our sins and put them all together, it, it, there probably wouldn't be a lot of goodness there. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be good. It'd be a lot of dirt. Uh, it'd be a lot of dust and grime. And if people wanted to, they could look at us that way. But I think all of us would hope that people wouldn't look at us in that light. That we would be able to convince people, no, I am more than the sum of my failures. I am more than the sum of all of my weaknesses. Um, thankfully, that is how God looks at us. God who knows our sins better than we know them. God who directly experienced our sins, because every sin is an offense against him, God could easily look at us as the sum of our weaknesses and failures, just as Javert looked at Fontaine, and how people could be easily tempted to look at Fontaine, because her failures are very present. They're very visible to so many people. And you can look at Fontaine and easily you know, add up a few failures, you could say, and add up some sins and weaknesses and look at her and see her in that light. But thankfully, Jean Valjean sees Fantine as more than that, as more than just the sum of her failures. And God looks at us in that way too. That's how God's mercy works. Mercy allows us to see people as fallen, yes, as fallen creatures, but capable of doing great things. Mercy allows us to see people as fallen, yes, but worthy of great dignity, even if other people might not see it. And mercy allows us to see people as fallen, yes, as fallen, but also being beloved sons and daughters of God, even in the midst of that fallibility. Fontaine's story is really a story of people not beholding her in the way which she actually deserved. And that, that's the tragedy of her story. Whether that was done by Felix, the very beginning of her story arc, by the townspeople who wouldn't give her any work, to Valjean initially. Valjean initially, when he fired her for not being honest with him. Whether it's the Thenardiers, who see her just as a, as a money stream, to that priest who wasn't even going to bury her. Fantine's story is one of people not beholding her in the way she deserves to be beholden. And I think it's a great lesson for us to always behold other people, to see them as God sees them, to look at others with the eyes of Christ, to see Christ in them and be Christ's hands and feet to others. That we might give alms from our hearts for people that in our lives might not necessarily correspond with our set of problems, but we see their problems as ours because we are brothers and sisters that we are our brother's keeper. Let's pray for that grace, brothers and sisters, to look at others with the eyes of Christ, to see Christ in them, and to be his hands and feet for others. So again, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you got any questions or comments, uh, feel, free to, um, feel free to put them in on, on Facebook Live. Uh, always good to hear from you. If you got any questions from uh, that presentation or any comments from it, I uh, would love to hear from you. We'll give you a little bit here because um, sometimes it takes a little while for the uh, for the stream to catch up. But, uh, but yeah, glad you were able glad you you were able to catch uh, to tune in and hope you enjoyed it. Um, you know uh, that, that that song I dreamed a dream as well. Even just personally, it, it's it's beautiful and yet it's so tragic. It talks about Fantine's idealism and her innocence and. Unfortunately, that, that dream is, has been shattered. And it just speaks of her, of, of her despair. That song ends with, Now life has killed the dream I dreamed. 
Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's real. It's, it's, it's tragic and it's, uh, it's gut wrenching, but I, I think for, for me personally, it's why I love the story of Les Miserables. It's because of the, the, the realism of it, the realism of that story. Um, you don't get that in a lot of other musicals. Uh, there, there's a realism to it that is, that, that's so raw and, and, and poignant and profound um, that a lot of other stories don't have. So, um, all right. So we'll uh, we'll wait if anybody has any questions or any or any comments. Always game for it. Yeah, and even just um, if you notice something, even while I'm talking, just throw in a comment there, and I'll uh, um, and I'll be able to, to see that and bring it up there. Yeah, thank you, Daisy. Uh, Daisy Kevorkian. and to see others as Christ would see them. Um, and Christ sees us, sees us as indispensable, irreplaceable, and unrepeatable. And he also sees us as more than the sum of our weaknesses too. Um, when, we, when we are, when we are, behel- are, are looked at in that way, um, we, we genuinely feel love. Um, for anyone who's married, you know that your spouse who loves you with everything that they have sees you as indispensable, irreplaceable, and unrepeatable. Um, but also throw in some forgiveness there for times where we screw up. Um, and you know, and you know what that means. Anyone, anyone who's married and, 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 and their beloved beholds them in that way knows exactly what that means. And, and even as a total aside, that's what makes marriage so beautiful is because marriage is called to make the love of God visible. The love that Christ has for the church and the church has for Christ and the love that God has for us and we have for him. Marriage is called to make that love visible. And if God beholds us in a way that, that, that is so beautiful like that, as the, we're indispensable and we're more than the sum of our weaknesses and he sees us for our true dignity and who we are, then married love, married love, should emulate that each and every day. Um, you know, another great line from Daisy, yeah, Christ has no hands but ours. Christ has no feet but ours. Um, Christ has no body on this earth but ours. Um, I want to say that's Mother Teresa. I don't know. I, it's either Mother Teresa or St. Francis of Assisi for some reason. I want to say it's Mother Teresa. It's, it's Mother Teresa who said that. Christ has no body on this earth but ours. And, and just, yeah, Mother Teresa, what a great example of seeing the dignity of others. She, she's a modern day Jean Valjean, at least, or, or, or that bishop, you know, taking the bold step of saying, no, your problems are my problems. I want to minister to the poorest of the poor, the sickest of the sick, the destitute of the destitute. Um, that's why the world loves Mother Teresa is because she beheld people in that way and looked at others with the eyes of Christ. Um, yeah, if you want to know why Mother Teresa was so beloved, it's because that's how she beheld people. Uh, that's, that's how they were in her eyes. And people loved her for it and revered her for it. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great example. Um, yeah, Mother Teresa would have seen Fontaine. She would have done exactly what Jean Valjean did, um, taking her to, to care for her, to provide for, for her needs, and to, and to give her the dignity uh, and compassion that, that she deserved. Um, and yeah, Mother Teresa cared for people she didn't agree with. Mother Teresa cared for people who were great sinners. Um, like, like I'm, I'm pretty positive Mother Teresa probably cared for some prostitutes. Like, I mean, you can probably imagine that she did. Um, she cared for them and saw ever, sees everyone, and she saw everyone as more than the sums of their weaknesses. Um, that's what made her example so beautiful. And of course, she did it combined with amazing prayer. Um, but yeah, that, that's uh, that's Mother Teresa in a nutshell. It's uh, it's so beautiful. Um, so yeah. We will wait another 30 seconds or a minute or so here if anybody has any questions. Um, but yeah, great comments from, from the folks so far. Thank you, Daisy, for, for those two. Um, yeah, next week I know we'll be talking about the story of Marius and Cosette, um, the love story uh, of Les Miserables. Uh, every musical needs a love story. Every musical needs one. And uh, and and yeah, it's it's so... It's, 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 it's a beautiful story. So we'll be talking about that and just their relationship and what we can learn uh, from the two of them. And yeah, AJ Walker, um, yeah, thank you for the people in our parish who work tirelessly to help permanent change, to make permanent change to our throwaway culture. Um, 
yeah, it's, you know, momentary kindness can bring relief, but we, we need to do more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, it's, it's to help empower people as well. Uh, and to do it with, with our help too. It's, uh, it's immensely important that, that it be a combination of that. Because yeah, that's what the bishop did. He empowered Valjean. He said, okay, yeah, use the, use the silver that I'm giving you to become an honest man. He empowered him, but he also gave him mercy. And, um, and, and I'm sure if Valjean would have needed you know, advice or assistance, that, that bishop would have readily given it uh, later on in his life. So yeah, it's it's always important to um, to do that for others. Yeah, what can we do to end a throwaway culture that sees people as dispensable? Um, there's so much there's so much again that our world sees, and I think I think throwaway culture is a is a beautiful de- description of it from Pope Francis, um, and it happens in so many facets of society. Um, but yeah, this throwaway culture that we live is uh, is poisonous and toxic because it. Um, at its deepest level, it, it treats people as objects meant to be thrown away and, dis- and discarded. And uh, no human being is meant to live like that. All right, so I guess we're going to go ahead and end uh, right now. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's always good to be with you on these Wednesday mornings, even if it's virtually. Um, stay tuned. Uh, tomorrow night, Father Schrader will begin week four of our study of Les Miserables, and I'll continue with week four next Wednesday, same time, same place, 9.30, um, here on Facebook Live, the Parish YouTube page, or BoxCast, or however you are watching uh, any of these any of these talks. But we, I thank you so much for being with us. Um, I hope you have a wonderful day. Why don't we go ahead and end with a prayer together. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. Great to be with you this morning. God bless you.